Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sudarshan. Uh, so this session is going to be about uh, the UID project and uh, what we are doing in terms of uh, reporting analytics and uh, uh, some of the APIs that we are planning to do. Uh, the original presenters, uh, Pramod, who is the chief architect, he's uh, unwell, so he's not been able to make it. And uh, Sanjay Jain, who is uh, the product manager, is on the way. He's uh, slightly delayed. So uh, I'll start off. So there are two broad sections to this. One is in terms of the whole BI and analy uh, reporting analytics framework that we have and the kind of data and how we use uh, data within UID. And the second session is about uh, the authentication and you know, what are the kind of applications that we see, Aadhaar data and Aadhaar services. Um, that's something that Sanjay will cover. In case he gets late, then we can always take that in the uh, last session. Um, so let's start off with um, you know, uh, reporting and analytics specifically in terms of UIDI. Um, when you when you go, I mean, uh, I've seen a lot of people talk about uh, you know uh, working with the government. So there's a lot of you know they understand reports. Uh, reports is something they understand, but that's pretty much a very ad hoc system in terms of if they have a meeting with um, any of the uh, senior officials, that's when they look at the data. But from a UIDI perspective, uh, what we wanted to look at was make this a very systemic process. Um, and when I talk about data here, there are two types of data. One is typically the data that you know you would, you would get published as part of census or the other data that you know then you can do a lot of statistical analysis of. But what, uh, as an organization, we also wanted to do was we wanted to use a lot of data literally on a real-time basis for operational uh, processes. Typically, as you see in corporates, you know, you, uh, you have data that comes real-time and then people and all the managers and all the whole field is working on that. We wanted to bring about that system uh, within UIDI to be able to drive a lot of the operational work. And the reason for that was because as, a, as, a, uh, um, as an ecosystem that UIDI has built, uh, UIDI is a very, very lean organization. I know it's hardly about 150 people, uh, core uh, people from a UIDI perspective. But from a project size, we, we are obviously uh, you know, looking at a very, very large project here. Um, and what we do is we work with a lot of partners. So one is what we call as registrars. These are the people like the state governments, in, in the case of uh, Karnataka, it's a Karnataka state government. Or you have SPIs, LICs, and the other non-state registrars as well. So they are the people who actually um, um, take, you know, enroll the people, uh, 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 enroll the agencies that enroll you on the field. So if somebody has got his Aadhaar number, they would, they would typically go to an enrollment station and they would enroll themselves. And uh, the state governments are the ones, the registrars are the ones who typically would uh, hire these agencies. So the UIDI is not directly going on the field and enrolling. Now this provides, uh, this, this scenario brings in a lot of complexities because what we have is, you know, we have the overall UIDI objectives, but then we have the, uh, we have a big layer in the middle of, the, of registrars and then we have the agencies on the field, and we want to make sure that all the whole ecosystem for such a large, I mean, for such a large and logistically complex uh, operations is all aligned in the same direction, is all working, and is all being monitored uh, in, a, in a consistent manner. And that's where we saw the need that you know we can't have a system which was a extremely post-mortem system that you know you're getting data and then you're figuring out that things are not working or working. What we wanted was to be able to drive a lot of the um, uh, uh, operations on the field very, very quickly. Um, so here are some of the ways in which we are using analytics and reporting. And this is, again, specifically from a very operations, running the day-to-day uh, -day operations perspective. So um, you know we have uh, an, an analytics portal, a reporting analytics portal that's an in-house portal that actually is open to all the ecosystem partners. And it's all login-based, so when you log in, you see data that is specific to you. And it covers all the key performance parameters, key operational parameters, and you are tracked and you know the status on a daily basis uh, of where things are, what I mean, right from enrollment status to the kind of quality you have, productivity. So you name the metric and typically you would be able to the metric. And separately, we also have what we call the NOC, which is a network operation center. This is uh, typically like what you would see. Um, you know, uh, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a big room with a lot of uh, screen uh, uh, panels, and you have a uh, set of people who are continuously looking at it. It runs the data center and a lot of the operations, because what we have is about a million enrollments and a, uh, 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 data for more than a million enrollments coming in on a uh, daily basis. 
and uh, what we need to do is make sure this ship is running smoothly and it's, uh, there are no bottlenecks. So it provides a real-time tracking. It's literally all screens, panels with which show where are the bottlenecks, what stage is that. I mean, how many packets are at what stage, at what processing level, and it typically offers you any drill downs and deep dives so that you know uh, uh, what's happening. So, so one is from a uh, monitoring operations on the field, so that's what the analytics portal does. It provides the whole ecosystem, our registrars. So for example, a sta a Karnataka state government can log in and they can see each of their enrollment agencies, a COMAD or the PRO, how many enrollments have they done, what's the, uh, and that too down at an operator level and at a station level, so they know exactly where what is happening. Uh, and like I said, you know, it's such a diverse ecosystem. You have state, non-state players, and a lot of the private sector players. So we can't run this whole ecosystem purely, purely based on uh, you know traditional methods. And information and data is the only source that we saw uh, as a, as we are running this organization. We provide end-to-end -end visibility uh, all through. So and that's a part of our you know uh, driving uh, the whole uh, transparency piece. So anybody who logs in, they can see right from the point where the packet started its journey, I mean, who came in and who enrolled at what point of time, right to the time it's processed and even to the time it is delivered. In fact, if you go on the website and there's a link called Checker Adha Status, that actually uh, at a packet level, even a resident or anybody can go and enter the basic details, and they can look at the full uh, details of where the packet is in real time. So it will tell you it is at this stage of processing or it has already been printed and on the way or it's been delivered. So you have a complete end-to-end -end visibility within the ecosystem as well as outside the ecosystem. And it's important because what we wanted to make sure was, you know, it's very easy to confuse things in such a large ecosystem because each of them has a different incentive or a different reason why they are part of this program. And, you know, there, are, there is a big chance that there is Going to be a, uh, you know, there could be a lot of conflicts right from the individual <coughs> contractual to uh, operational uh, conflicts, and hence you need a single source of truth. A single I mean, data typically is the most objective form of truth. That then is something which nobody can uh, question. Uh, this is also uh, interesting. We actually use real-time feedback, so data is updated pretty much on a real-time basis. Uh, uh, midnight, the data is updated, so you can pretty much look at. Uh, today, what, what happened till last night. So whatever data we have, everything is published, available on a real time. And typically, in a lot of the government programs, you know, you would have seen data that comes in if there's a lot of gap between when the data actually comes and then is uh, used for uh, by the organization themselves. And that is what we wanted to cut down the time and drive operations using literally real time data fed back to the whole ecosystem. Um, we have fraud detection modules also because uh, uh, there is obviously going to be um, uh, a natural uh, uh, behavior towards trying to beat the system. So we have fraud detection modules for multiple, uh, so one is from an enrollment perspective, so people who enroll on the field, we pro uh, we have uh, based on the number of pool and the rooms that we have uh, um, uh, created, we have the uh, fraud detection module and that uh, scans each packet and then takes a call whether this could be a potential fraud or not. And if so, then it goes through a separate set of uh, processes. And then um, from a transparency perspective, one is we, we spoke about all the data, at least from an operational perspective, we try to share it with the ecosystem. And similarly, from a um, from sharing it out, outside the ecosystem as well, we provide a lot of the data uh, as data sets and uh, outside. In fact, uh, uh, we, it's all anonymized and rolled up data sets aggregated at certain levels depending on what the data set is. And this is uh, soon to be uh, you know, uh, available as live data feeds. You can subscribe as an RSS data feed and you'll come to know when the data has been updated. Uh, there's also an analytics white paper we have online and that speaks in much more detail in terms of specifically what we've been doing, what's the kind of architecture we've been doing. I do not want to cover that in too much detail, but um, I will just cover a couple of slides after this. But uh, uh, that white paper talks in much more detail in terms of what we do from a, a data uh, analytics perspective, what kind of structure we have. And it also recommends from a government, uh, as, as a template, how can this be used by other government programs as well for, uh, uh, for, for setting up their own DI modules and reporting analytics modules. But this was shared by uh, with a lot of the ministries and departments, and we got a lot of interest back from them. So soon we'll be presenting to uh, some ministries in terms of how they can use these systems for uh, uh, for their own uh, operations. Um, this is just a small snapshot. Again, uh, 
I wouldn't say we do any high-end modeling and analytics as yet. Uh, what we've started on is to make sure the base system is set from a, having a proper reporting uh, system in place. Uh, we have basic visualization in place, uh, and uh, a lot of the data. And you got to, one also needs to understand that the audience here is people who have not been exposed to this kind of data or are not used, exposed to just the use of data in the first place. So, which is why it was very important that we. I mean, we, we can do as complicated as we want, but what we wanted to do was to inculcate the habit of looking at data on a regular basis, and which is why it was very important to just stick to very, very basic data, a very basic visualization, and we also provide a lot of canned reports, so we don't expect people to go real-time down to data sets, create custom data sets, so we just provide very simple thing which they can take a printout of and put up uh, on a file and then review that. Um, and this has... Uh, all of this is login based, so when you log in, then uh, you know, data and downloads are uh, specific to what uh, credentials you have. Uh, at a very high level, you know, this. One question is is the data available? Uh, the back end data for the PSD chart, the raw data, is that available? We, like I said, we, we are publishing uh, 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 data sets, anonymized and rolled up data sets for public as. So for the ecosystem partners, they don't get access to the raw data. Even from a reporting, in the, I'll talk about the thing, even from a reporting infrastructure perspective, we have certain parts of data which we use for reporting only. So we don't have access to the raw individual data that we can then uh, you know, uh, use. It's typically data sets that are aggregated at certain levels which are to be used for specific reports only. Are these data sets already online or are you planning to Have you? Uh, okay. So when, when do you intend to do this? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But uh, a lot of work is already begun on this space, so you know, soon as. Yeah, the data sets are ready. Yeah. So, okay, we'll do process sure, sure. So yeah. the, and those, those processes are not being done yet. Yeah. Uh, at a very high level, the whole business. So, um, one good thing about uh, the, the design uh, at the initial stages was the whole BI modules and the reporting modules was there from day one in the whole overall architecture design. And which is why today we have the, all the modules in place. And uh, it, it obviously spans the standard uh, you know, uh, data capture. So, in fact, we capture a lot of operational metadata. So, I don't know how many of you have uh, done enrollments on the field. But you know, data like so if somebody's enrolling, you know, the operator, for example, how much time did he spend on each screen? So when he moves to the next screen, so he's taking your demographic information, then he moves to the biometric, wherein he's taking right slab, left slab. So we are able to capture time stamps on each of that. And the reason we do that is because we want to help improve the operation of the productivity. So when we go back to people with the with insights in terms of you know where they are typically slower, how they can improve their productivity, you know, that that is an incentive for for somebody to look at data because you know the faster they do and the uh, smarter they do, the more uh, enrollments they do on the field. Um, similarly, then we have data acquisition, so that's uh, we model in which all the source systems that feed data into the organization, so like enrollment, documentation, other uh, sources. Then uh, we have the whole data storage, uh, data warehouse uh, module. So uh, we have, of course, what is the production system, so that is all the servers and all the live uh, uh, processing happens. But there's a copy that is created, so report. So from a reporting uh, databases perspective, we obviously do not have access to the production data. So there is a separate set of uh, 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 data uh, sets, uh, data warehouse available for reporting specifically, and that's what we work on. Uh, data distribution is then done by multiple ways. So we have data marts on uh, data sets and some of the raw data that is used to publish this information. And then data access is uh, uh, how we then finally share this information ahead, and which is through the delivery platform the portal that we spoke about. So there are standard dashboards, and we also offer a lot of self-service uh, capability. And the reason this is important is because, like I spoke, that we have a very lean team, so we can't sit and uh, you know uh, uh, we can't do the an uh, analysis for each and every partner of ours. So what we try to build is a sense of system so people can actually go and look at all the data and figure out how they want to slice and dice the data and download uh, data sets for themselves based on that. 
and then a uh, lot of ad hoc reports also can get generated and then there are the canned reports because uh, most of our uh, people prefer to just take orders home back to that. Uh, at a very high level key principles uh, in terms of the whole uh, 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 BI reporting uh, uh, modules, uh, we are completely open source um, and uh, we uh, write our uh, file system to even the BI modules that we use, we use Penta for which is an open source software and uh, we, we, we stick to that all through. Uh, it's all scalable in here, I mean, uh, given that we, we need to move to a very, uh, uh, the size of the data is going to run and it's going to be a huge data set. So the system has been built so that it can scale, it's very modular in nature and can scale very quickly. Um, uh, what we also do is we, we, so since we spoke a lot about operational data, so you know we have access to not just processed data that in terms of how many people have got involved, but also a lot of that operational data, uh, real-time data that that uh, is provided, and both of these are modules are handled separately. Um, I mean, big data, uh, all the file handling and storage systems we uh, we use pretty much most of the cutting-edge technologies. Uh, data security and privacy is extremely important for us. So we have security, standard physical and electronic security, and from a privacy perspective, I mean, within UID, of course, there's a lot of systems, but from a reporting and an analytics perspective also, we have a, a data council that uh, monitors all of the data that is shared and uh, our tribe. No personally identifiable information is available to any of the reporting data sets. And then there is a huge amount of anonymization and aggregation that is done so that only uh, you know, specific piece of data uh, comes out to our team. Uh, this is about other I should have started this early part. I'm going to take over. I mean, uh, 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 about other, I, I guess uh, you know, most of uh, you uh, are aware of this, but what we're trying to do is build the largest biometric uh, system in the world. Uh, the key point here is we're trying to provide online um, identity to all the residents. Uh, and this is based on one identity, which is all uh, deduplicated. So you get one number, and that's the number that will stay with you for a lifetime. And um, uh, from an open data perspective, you know, uh, all of other data is accessible via uh, the online authentication service that we uh, cover in the next slides. And what I just spoke about, which is the uh, BI data that's accessible internally and externally through our data portal. So, uh, other authentication is about the question of, you know, when a person enrolls with us, they tell us who he is, we ensure they're unique, and then authentication is about confirming that identity. So when they when claim that identity is somewhere, somebody, you can validate it. Now, one of the key principles is that we only respond with a yes or no. We actually don't give out any personal information during this process. And uh, the other part is that it's online. <coughs> Uh, we support multi-factor authentication uh, using biometrics, uh, PIN, OTP, and of course any combinations of these, and uh, all sorts of protocols and devices. The API spec is again public. We encourage you to go look at it <coughs> and uh, you know, give us any feedback or use it. Better. So, can you go back to the API? Actually, it's all on our website, and I think this PPT is uh, available to you. Okay. Yeah, in any case, it's <coughs> a simple search for UID authentication API. And uh, so at a glance, this is what it is. You've given your Aadhaar number, so you're not actually searching with biometrics against the entire system. So one is to one match. So when you provide us the Aadhaar number, we go pull up your appropriate data and then you send us additional data, either your biometrics or demographic, we match it, and we respond with a yes or no. So it's a very simple system. It's uh, eminently parallelizable and scalable. We expect to support uh, about 100 million odds a day. So in over a 10-hour period, that's the kind of volume we're scaling up for. Um, and a lot of the applications are actually quite obvious. Uh, a lot of the government welfare programs would use it, the financial inclusion, the banking systems would uh, be using it. Uh, there's a KYC requirement for a lot of telecom providers, for banks, for other service providers, and we expect to be participating in that. And, sorry. No, I'm customer, sorry. I'm so used to these acronyms. 
Uh, but yes, this is a more customer requirement where service providers are required to know who they're servicing. And in particular, uh, this is used potentially for from a law perspective if they want to go back and trace somebody. But uh, essentially, this requirement has been put into various service providers. Um, and we expect that eventually the Aadhaar number will end up unifying various systems and providing the interface. This is a white paper that we have published on authentication, and we expect to actually come out with uh, in the document shortly, which talks about uh, the effectiveness of biometrics in authentication. So that's it. So at this point, I'll take questions and uh, solutions. On the yeah. This is a lot of sensitive data. Yes. So you must obviously be having security systems and all. So are there any laws that prevent misuse of this data? So overall, uh, we don't have in India significant uh, data protection and privacy laws. There are some which exist, and uh, but from the UIDI perspective, we actually put in a lot of protection onto this data. So basically, resident data is not visible to anybody other than you know people inside UIDI for the purpose of doing uh, other issuance or any other investigation. And from the external perspective, the only data we give out is anonymized and uh, there's no personal information available. Okay, so the, the other area is only a, only a yes or no, is it? Nothing exactly. else? Nothing else. There's nothing else that's accessible. Then. Nothing else. No exactly. other APIs you're building on. Uh, nothing that would cause, I mean, there are APIs for different purposes, but the authentication API only provides a yes or no. And in any case, none of the APIs provides any data outside the system. And anybody can query this? They are using APIs? Or? No, there again, there is a, for the authentication API, you have come out to an authentication framework where you have to be a registered user agency to actually access the API. So, um, yeah. uh, do you, can you give us an update on what is the legal framework to protect this data? How, okay. What is the status of it? You know, obviously, your UIDA your is not responsible for the law in terms of the privacy laws that exist in India, but you must be aware of it because it does affect your work. Right. Can you give us an update on that? Uh, what do you know of the status? So, basically there is no overarching data privacy law. Everything comes under the IT Act and the provisions that come from there, where as a service provider, this, this is not my phone, okay. Uh, so, it comes under the uh, IT Act, and that's pretty much the only act that covers data issues right now. There is a privacy bill uh, which is in parliament which I don't think has moved for a while. And uh, this UIDI also had proposed a bill which would then uh, give protection to UIDI data alone. And uh, again, that's not, it's still in parliament. It's not being either approved or whatever. But so because there are two concerns with this. You know, one is leakage from within the UIDI database. Certainly. A rogue employee with access to data could leak it. And I work with government data. I know how um, transparent this whole system is when it comes to pulling data out of the system because uh, there may be a framework in place that says that data can only be accessed in a certain manner. But that framework also prevents day-to-day -day operations and therefore lower level employees find various ways to get around it for their own convenience. Okay? And I work with the Karnataka government. I've seen how this happens. There's one public directory at one particular IP address, which has slash prescom logs. It's got data for everything. Okay? And you're supposed to just not acknowledge this in public. That's how it works. So you want data from the data center, you call them, they'll put it in this public folder, you download it from there. So this, this happens in reality because the rules that govern access are so tight that they prevent data -day operations. And I'm concerned that this may or may not be the case with UIDA. So that's, that's one problem. The second thing is uh, the UIDA, um, the public API is only a yes or no answer, okay? And that's an extremely powerful tool because it lets me now correlate private databases. I have a private database which has a UIDI number, somebody else has one, we can now merge our databases because the UIDI number is guaranteed to be accurate, okay? And that is a problem, that, that's, that's not your problem, it's a privacy problem which there should be a privacy law for to prevent or to regulate this kind of data is much So I actually completely agree with you on the second point where you talk about the need for an overarching privacy law. And uh, it's a requirement, UIDI or not. And uh, in some sense, uh, I mean, the UIDI becomes the uh, sort of 
lightning rod for all criticism related to the overarching privacy law. So we are a little sensitive about this. But, uh, but the fact is that, yes, we do need a privacy law uh, which protects data for residents in general. But on the other side, a lot of our systems are actually uh, you know, not hooked up, and that leads to a lot of inconvenience to residents. And so, you know, we end up having to play this balancing act where uh, you, know, you don't want to prohibit people from merging to databases because uh, that actually can be used to find, for example, fraud in the PDS. When you talk about the fact that uh, the number of ration cards in the state is more than the number of residents. Uh, now, you know, somebody's going to have to go look through two databases to figure out who's real and who's not. And so somewhere in there is a balancing act which has to be worked out. And it's not just about private databases. So, and also there's a lot of issues about maturity in the society with regards to privacy. And to, I mean, today you could go to a street corner and stand and fill out, hand out forms without telling who you are, and people will fill in new information, so all kinds of information. So you know, that's. <laughs> uh, so we have to balance the two extremes where people are completely free with their information, and where we are concerned about people being tracked and so on. So somewhere in there is a balancing act. UIDA is a player in it, but we don't control it. Yeah. A non-privacy question to move away from that. So one of the one important part of UID data is address, mm -hmm. right? And since there is no standard way of actually filling out addresses anywhere in India, uh, how do you manage that? So one one thing which is standardized is PIN code. Mm -hmm. Okay, but uh, is there a list like so? Has UID actually come out with like with a way of actually doing identification based on PIN code? How, how does that work? And would that be available for the public since you've already undertaken the trouble? Okay, so there are two databases uh, which exist in the country today. Um, one of them is with the Registrar General of India. They actually have an entire administrative uh, hierarchy of India in a codified form. So you get, we have codes for the states, districts, sub-districts, and down up to the villages and uh, cities. Uh, nothing below the level of city would show up in that system. And the second database is the postal data. So they have this pin code hierarchy, which doesn't exactly merge with the, you know, they have postal circles and not states, and so a state could actually be divided across both, or a pin code can go across a state border. It just happens, by the way. So, and they don't cleanly map to each other. But we have worked with the postal department to try and get this mapping. And in fact, the client enforces that. So you type in your postal, your PIN code, and it only shows you the villages, towns, and cities which that maps to. So that, at least, so at all codified levels, we have a separate field that ensures that this data stays consistent. Anything under a city, in the, for example, the, uh, depending on where you live, it could be a ward, it could be a neighborhood, um, or in Bangalore, you have layouts. Those are not codified, and uh, those are freeform entry right now. That's basically the best you could do. Does mapping be released to the public? We, I think we'll try and get that out because this is really public data. It's just that it comes from two sources, neither of which is UIDI. One of them is the RGI, and one of them is the postal department. And we have worked with them to try and get it together, but I don't see why we couldn't release it. Yeah. The developer portal of the UIDI. Uh, is it is it is it open to only uh, registered users? No. Well, I think it's uh, you have to register at the portal, but anybody can register. There's no limitation. And we have five more minutes. Okay. So, what does it take to get registered access to the API? Uh, right now, actually, the developer portal you can get the API itself. There is a uh, developer access to the API, which is not the same as the public. So, it's not every UID number is accessible through that. And then you have to go through the process and become an uh, authorized user agency uh, for that. All right, so if, if I were to say develop APIs for accessing the UIDA database for various languages and frameworks, mm -hmm. now at what level of access do I need to co-build this? See, um, I obviously need to test it with live data to know that my library works. 
Okay. Uh, but I'm not actually interested in the data. I'm only interested in making sure that this intermediate library works. So what, what so do I think you need? Just to go ahead, register, uh, let us know what you need. We'll work with you, help you out. That's not an issue. They do have a dummy data. They must be there is dummy data, but he wants languages and some maybe some more specific data. Yeah. So, which if it's not there, you can work with that. Um, in the API, there seems to be no concept of the person who's being authenticated approving who can authenticate him. That is true. Is, has that been thought of, debated? Is that a valid idea? Because I'm, that solves a lot of the privacy. I'm not convinced it does, but it's an interesting thought. Uh, because finally, end of the day, you're going to there are two issues with that. Okay, let's just think of it from a scale perspective. It means that when you come in and specify your uh, authentication preferences, I have to have a sort of a portal which is you know for every resident of the country, uh, which is becomes a fairly large scale exercise in itself. And second, a lot of times you don't necessarily know who is authenticating. I mean, if you go swipe a credit card somewhere at a shop, and on your bill it shows up under a different name. So there's a lot of federation, et cetera, going on. And, uh, or do you want to go by a class of providers? Like, do you only want banks to authenticate you, but not telecom companies? Uh, there may be ways to uh, look at it, but it's an interesting idea. I'm not sure of its practicality, but the technology is going to improve. At some point, it will become feasible. So, uh, it's an idea worth looking at. Nice to meet you. Uh, is there some applications that are already enabled and using Bitcoin Core so far, we have uh, only one field application which is uh, using this, which is actually for financial inclusion. So you might have read about the Narega payments being made under this uh, UIDR. So we have enabled business correspondents who can work with certain banks to withdraw funds from those bank accounts using UID application. Do you know which states are doing uh, This is happening in Jharkhand right now. The other one that's happening is in uh, Mysore. Indian Oil is uh, doing a, a cylinder delivery with that. So the fact that the data council is very interesting, I would like to know what kind of cases have come up in front of it. And the second was uh, uh, the data, what kind of servers are they stored on? So I work with the data company, and so the servers were, uh, there are rules governing how the servers can be used. So the data is non-modifiable for 10 years. So do you have those kind of uh, so, so yeah. So the data council specifically is about approving which data sets can be made public. So really, there's no cases per se that could come up before that. Uh, the second is that we basically once we decide that this data is public, uh, it will eventually be stored in a place and you can access it through the portal. Uh, so you know really the actual storage and servers are different, but it's the rules that govern the data set that are more important as to how long the data lives. Uh, and I don't know where exactly. So, uh, I mean, uh, right now it's been at a high level in terms of making sure. So, we spoke about a lot of the reporting and what comes out uh, and is accessed by the ecosystem. Yes. This comes and makes sure that the data, A, at one level is sufficiently anonymized and you know, those basic rules are met. And also the fact that what of, it, what of these metrics is published to the ecosystem from a measurement and operations perspective. So that's the front end. The back end part is what I was asking about. The servers where you're storing it, you haven't hit that block right now. You haven't hit that block right now. One last question. One last question. I don't know, I have a question I have to add to what he said. So in case anybody has a question, can ask. Okay, one last question. <laughs> if a citizen has some problem with the way you are codified, because like in a credit card company, sometimes some mistake is made, all the headache belongs to you. Now, if suppose something goes wrong, how can an Indian citizen rectify what is the process that is going to be used? So we have an update process which is not yet rolled out to the field, which will be rolled out within, within the next uh, refresh cycle, in a couple of months. Uh, during that cycle, we will roll out a process by which uh, any resident, not citizen, resident can come and update the data. So that would uh, take care of that.